Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. Dr. Andy Bannister is an adjunct speaker with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Andy heads up the SOLA Centre for Public Christianity in Scotland, prior to which he was RZIM's Canada Director. Andy holds a PhD in Islamic Studies and regularly addresses audiences on apologetics, faith and culture. How can we reconcile the God of the Bible with a world of evil and suffering? How can we help people from whom this question is an obstacle to faith? Come and gain a firm foundation. Now, here's Dr. Andy Bannister. Father God, we thank you uh, again uh, for Break Forth. Thank you for the wonderful gift you have given us, given us of this weekend where we can come away from our churches, our homes, our busy lives and uh, take time out to listen and to learn and uh, to meet with you. And uh, Lord, I just ask, as we come to the end of the day, some of us are probably tired and flagging a bit. Lord, I just ask that you'd give us the strength uh, to track with this most uh, difficult and most important topic. Uh, This is a topic that is so much an important one when it comes to sharing our faith. So many of our friends will raise this question of uh, of how we reconcile the existence of you, who are good and uh, and all-powerful, with a world in which there is evil. So Lord, would you help us think this through, work this through, so that the next time we encounter somebody raising uh, this question... We have something uh, we can share with them in order to point them to you. Thank you for uh, all of your gifts to us. And uh, be with us now, we pray, in this next 50 minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's get uh, cracking. And um, really start off by making this observation. Uh, Evil is still a four-letter word. Evil is is still a four-letter word. What do I mean by that? I mean this. We live in a world in which there is a huge amount of technological sophistication. We have wonderful technology. We have wonderful medicine. We have all kinds of clever things we have done as human beings. Yet despite all of that, evil and uh, suffering and pain and violence remain some of the most intractable problems facing uh, us as individuals and as a society. You only have to open the news or turn on your or turn on your television uh, to see daily uh, examples. Um, if it's not a violence uh, in uh, Islamist violence in uh, parts of the Muslim world, uh, if it's not drought and famine and HIV and all kinds of things, there is something. You only have to open your newspaper to see that evil and pain and suffering are all around us. Now, of course, the existence of evil and suffering and pain raise all kinds of questions uh, for us as uh, Christians, or they certainly should raise questions for us. And of course, the biggest is that one I touched on in that prayer just now. How do we reconcile the fact that we believe in a God who is good and powerful and the creator and sustainer of everything with the fact that we live in a world in which there is evil? How do we hold those things together? You see, for some people, That is the point at which they lose their faith. Some Christians have lost their faith over this very issue. Uh, One of the most uh, well-known skeptics uh, writing today is a gentleman called Bart Ehrman. Uh, His books regularly top the bestseller lists, and he's written books attacking the Bible and attacking Christianity on other grounds. But in one of his books, a book called God's Problem, he tells the kind of biographical story of how he actually lost his Christian faith in the first place. And he explains that it was to do uh, with a problem of evil. I'm going to give you a quote from him, to give you a flavor of what he's written, because I think on this issue, uh, almost more than any other, it's important to hear what those who do not share our convictions are saying as we think through how to respond. So these are these may be hard words to hear, but we need to hear them and see where he's coming from. So this is Bart Ehrman in his book, God's Problem. He writes these words. And again, if you get the PowerPoint that we emailed to you, this quotation will be there, so you don't have to write this down. Bart writes, If there is an all-powerful and loving God in the world, why is there so much excruciating pain and unspeakable suffering? 
The problem of suffering has haunted me for a very long time. It was what made me begin to think about religion when I was young, and it was what led me to question my faith when I was older. Ultimately, it was the reason that I lost my faith. <clears throat> Eventually, I felt compelled to leave Christianity altogether. I did not go easily. On the contrary, I left kicking and screaming, wanting desperately to hold on to the faith I had known since childhood and had come to know intimately from my teenage years onward. But I came to a point where I could no longer believe. It's a very long story, but the short version is this. I realized that I could no longer reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of life. In particular, I could no longer explain how there can be a good and all-powerful God actively involved with the world, given the state of things. Very kind of honest, kind of raw quotation there from Bart Ehrman. And the thing is this, if we're honest, everybody is forced at some point to think about the problem of pain and suffering. Every single human being, I think, actually at some point in their lives, is forced to ask why. Whether we are Christians or atheists or Buddhists or Muslims or Hindus or Jews, there is something about the, uh, the way that suffering and pain cuts very deep, uh, deeply emotionally as well as intellectually that means that question becomes a question for everybody. The world is a fairly messy place. And we'll explore that idea more a little bit later. But before we kind of dive into this in more depth, I think it's worth noting there are in fact not one, but two problems of evil. There are not one, but two problems of evil. What do I mean? Well, the first is the philosophical problem of evil, and the second is what I would call the emotional problem of evil. What do I mean by that? Well, the philosophical problem of evil is the kind of logical puzzle of how you reconcile the existence of evil with the existence of God. Now, here's the interesting thing. Over the centuries, Christians have developed some pretty good answers. There are some very good philosophical answers that will help you think through how you can reconcile God's existence with the existence of evil and suffering. There are some wonderful books and resources out there, and that's brilliant. However, there is also the emotional problem of evil. And that's the problem you have when evil strikes you personally, when you personally experience suffering or bereavement or loss or violence, whatever it may be. And here's the thing. It's very important that we do not mix those two problems up. Because if you do, things can get messy quite quickly. If you encounter somebody who has just lost a loved one, perhaps their wife has just lost the fight to cancer, perhaps they've lost a child in a traffic accident, and you encounter them, perhaps they're a colleague at work, and they open up and they tell you their story, and how they're hurting, and how they can't possibly believe in God because of what's happened, and you look them in the eye and you go, hey, no problem, I read a book on the problem of evil, and I can solve your problem in three philosophical steps. Let me do that for you. Probably, probably, they will punch you on the nose. And quite frankly, they would probably be right. Because what they're looking for is not a clever philosophical answer. What they're looking for is something that can deal with the pain that is striking them here around this issue. There is an existential force to the problem of evil that makes this question particularly uh, tricky uh, to deal with and to ensure that we deal with carefully rather than think we can solve it through clever philosophy. It's very interesting that C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest apologists who ever lived, in my opinion, um, who wrote many, many amazing books on apologetics, wrote a book, a philosophical book, less setting out his answer to the problem of evil. And, um, and that's a very good book. It's called The Problem of Pain. Maybe some of you have read that book. Well, some years after he wrote that book, his beloved wife died after a long fight with cancer. And Lewis realized that actually much of what he'd written didn't actually help him existentially when it came to dealing with actual loss. And he went out, he set out to write a second book in which he dealt with the problem of pain from a personal perspective. It's called A Grief Observed. Well, in that second book, as he's finally Fighting with the raw emotion in the early days of the loss of his wife, he wrote this powerful quotation. So this is a Christian now writing, and he holds on to his faith, but he's admitting how hard it was as he walked through uh, the, the valley of darkness, as he walked through bereavement. Lewis writes, sooner or later... We must face, I must face the question in plain language. What reasons have we, except our own desperate wishes, to believe that God is by any standard we can conceive good? Doesn't all the prima facie evidence suggest the opposite? What have we to set against it? 
And so I just flag that, up, flag that up at the start to ensure that we don't sit here in this seminar and think to ourselves, wonderful, if I just have 40 minutes of kind of clever philosophical apologetics, I can get the problem solved, and the next time somebody raises it, I can give them the answer. It's more complicated than that, and that's not the approach I'm actually going to take uh, as we go through this afternoon. We'll touch on some philosophy, but we're also going to touch on some issues of the heart as well as issues of the head. Now, as we begin looking at the problem of evil and beginning, just beginning to think through how we might respond, it's worth noting as we do that, that there are two traps that people sometimes fall into when we discuss evil and pain and suffering with them. When we talk to our sceptical friends about these things, there are two traps that I think people can fall into that's worth being aware of as Christians. Uh, and so we know that we can, we can help our friends avoid them. Two traps that people commonly fall into. The first is what I would call the trap of utopianism. What do I mean by the trap of utopianism? Well, many of our friends, I think, believe this way. They think to themselves, well, do you know what? The world is a messy place. The world is a messy place, but do you know what? We're getting better. And eventually, with enough technology and enough science and enough advancement, human advancement, we can feed the last poor person. We can eradicate the last disease. We can stamp out the last war. And we can ensure that maple leaves win every game. We can solve all the problems of human existence. And we can do that using technology. We can get to utopia. It's a very common belief out there that people have. It may be a messy world now, but we can solve it. The other trap that people fall into is, uh, is the trap of dualism. And by the trap of dualism works this way. The other thing that some, sometimes people will say to you when you talk about, problem, about pain and suffering and evil, people will, will say to you something like, well, the problem with the world is the bad people. The problem with the world is the naughty people. And if we could just round up the people who are bad and the people who are evil and the people who are naughty and put them over here, then those of us who are good and nice and Canadian and British, we can stay over here and we've solved the problem. We just need to separate out the good from the bad. And of course, whenever people come out with that kind of answer, they obviously include themselves in the good people. That's another very common human response to the problem of evil. The problem is simply this. The 20th century shattered both of those misconceptions. The 20th century put the lie to both of those traps. In the 20th century, two things happened. Science and technology actually didn't solve the problems of society. They made them worse. Science and technology, as well as all the blessings they gave us, they also gave us two world wars. They gave us the Holocaust. They gave us killing on an industrial scale. They gave us the killing fields of Cambodia and a myriad other evils. Over 200 million people were killed or displaced during the 20th century alone. So much for utopianism. The world is not getting better. The other thing that the 20th century showed us, and showed us uh, in a way it was a wake-up call for many people, is the way, it was the way that evil and suffering are not just carried out by moral monsters. In the trials that followed World War II, the Nuremberg trials that, uh, that put on trial those who had committed some of the worst atrocities uh, of the Nazi years, it was discovered to the shock of many people that some of those who committed those, those acts of supreme violence and sadism during World War II were not moral monsters. They were ordinary men, and in some cases women, who had simply got caught up in extraordinary evil and had done the most extraordinarily evil things. But they went home from their concentration camps and their acts of violence to break bread with their family and live normal everyday lives. On the outside, they were normal people. They looked like everybody else. That was quite a wake-up call. We need to take that very seriously indeed, in fact. The fact that evil is something that ordinary, everyday people can do. Back in the uh, over 100 years ago now, the Times newspaper uh, in London, England, ran a, ran a letter writing competition around this theme. And they, the competition went this way. Uh, readers were invited to write in with their answer to this question, what is wrong with the world? And there was a £50 price, a lot of money in those days. Or well, the competition was won by a gentleman called G.K. Chesterton, who uh, responded to the question, what is wrong with the world? He was a Christian, with this answer. Dear sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> The thing is, we laugh, but also at the same time, how astonishingly insightful that it's so easy to talk about the evil out there when the biggest problem is actually the evil in here. And if we don't recognize that as we talk about the problem of evil, we have a problem. So we need to bear that in mind too as we go on. 
So this afternoon's subject then is a difficult one. There's a lot of sensitivities behind it. We're deal dealing with emotional issues. We're dealing with philosophical issues. We're dealing with issues that affect the world out there. We're dealing with issues that affect the heart in here. So many different threads we need, uh, we need to, uh, to weave together. But we need to do so honestly. Any answer to the problem of evil needs to begin by recognizing the problem and being very honest about some of the issues around it. How do we kind of focus our minds on the subject then to really begin sort of getting into what Christianity has to say on this subject? Well, I think the best way to focus our minds with laser sharp precision on some of the issues around this question as we begin, look, as we begin heading towards an answer is by telling you a story. The story I want to tell you takes place on, uh, took place on October the 2nd, uh, 2006. October the 2nd, 2006, was an ordinary uh, fall day in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. The school day was just beginning at West Nickel Mines Amish School, uh, when the doorway was darkened by the, by, the figure of a, by the figure of a gentleman called Charlie Roberts, who was a milk truck driver in the local community. Now, nine years earlier, he and his wife, his wife rather, had given birth to their first child, a baby girl, and she had lived for just 20 minutes before dying. Charlie Roberts had never forgiven God for the death of his, uh, his baby daughter, and today was the day he was going to get revenge. He drew a gun, and he forced the teachers to leave, he forced the male students to leave, and he had the remaining 10 girls lie down on the floor of the classroom. <laughs> He told them he was sorry for what he was about to do, but he was angry at God, and he had to punish some Christian girls to get back at him. One of the older girls bravely responded with the words, shoot me first. As state police arrived, Charlie Roberts began shooting, and before finally turning the gun on himself and taking his own life. As the gunshots died uh, away, five girls, uh, ranging in age from 7 to 13 years old, 13 years old uh, lay dead, and another five were hospitalized. You may remember that story, the Amish school shooting. It made headlines around the world when it happened. But the interesting thing is the story doesn't stop there. That's not where the story ends. The, um, in the aftermath of the tragedy, the, uh, the Amish community there in Pennsylvania stunned the world by responding to that tragedy, that school shooting, not with anger or bitterness, uh, but with forgiveness towards the perpetrator. Amish community members visited Charlie Roberts' family to comfort them in their loss. They even set up a trust fund for his widow and their three young children. On October the 13th, 2006, the family of Roberts sent this statement to the Amish community. They wrote, Our family wants each one of you to know that we are overwhelmed by the forgiveness, grace, and mercy that you've extended to us. Your love for our family has helped to provide the healing that we so desperately need. For this, we sincerely thank you. Now, I tell that story because I think it raises some questions that I want to address in the, in, the, in the half hour remaining to us very, very profoundly indeed. It raises some very interesting questions, that story. Two in particular. One is the, is the big one. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do we live in a world in which innocent schoolchildren can get shot, just like that story uh, tells? How do we, why do we live in that kind of world? How do we make sense of it? But it raises another question that also has to be answered. Where did the Amish community find the power to forgive from? How were they able to respond to evil in the way that they did, rather than anger with anger and recrimination? Those are two questions I want us to keep in mind as we proceed and, and, and begin to unpack this together. And as we begin to unpack it, I want to begin by noting that uh, pro the problem of evil and, uh, and suffering and violence that we're looking at this afternoon is often used uh, by our atheist friends as a stick to beat God with. Um, we saw some of that in Bar Ehrman's story at the beginning, but certainly many atheists I know love to use the problem of evil as a stick to beat God with. Their argument runs this way. The sceptical argument is fairly easy to understand. In fact, the version of the argument I'm about to introduce to you from, a, from an atheist writer comes from a British atheist. Uh, so many atheists are British. I've apologized for that already once today. We do <laughs> seem to specialize in exporting atheism and uh, financial chaos and bad sport. J.L. Mackey's <laughs> argument against God. Uh, he's a J.L. Mackey was a very famous uh, philosopher, and he argued this way. Here's his argument from 1963, I believe. He said, if God exists, he is all-powerful. Fair enough. If God exists, he is perfectly good. Well, if a perfectly good, all-powerful God exists, said Mackie, he would pre prevent evil. 
But of course, evil exists, and uh, therefore, said J. O. Mackey, God doesn't. You get the big idea in that argument. Mackey's very, very clear, very straightforward argument. You can understand it. The argument is, is, it goes like this. If God existed and he were all-powerful, he would prevent evil. If God existed and he, and he, rather, if God existed and he's all powerful, he could prevent evil. If God existed and he's all good, he would prevent evil. Since he hasn't prevented evil, he's either not all good or he is not all powerful. Therefore, QED, the Christian God does not exist. I have run into that argument from so many skeptics across the years. I regularly get it from university students who come up to me at Q and A's and these kind of these kind of forums and raise this this question. It's a very popular skeptical argument. And when you first look at it, it looks quite powerful. But whenever I hear it, I always want to res- respond this way. I respond by saying, can I just stop a moment? Stop a moment. Not so fast. You see, there is a problem in the atheist's use of evil as an argument like this. What's the problem in their argument? Well, the problem is this. Inherent in the atheist's attack on God is their belief that they can tell the difference between good and evil. The atheist assumes that he or she can look at the world and go, this is good and this is evil. Tell the difference and therefore use that as a stick to beat God with. They assume that murder is bad and child abuse is bad and rape is bad and so on and so forth. But the question we can ask them is how can we tell? Their attack against God assumes a moral standard. It assumes a moral standard by which they can divide things into good and evil. But the problem is this, where does a moral standard come from? Well, to have a moral standard, you need a moral law. You need some kind of moral law that tells you this is good and this is evil. But the problem is, where does the moral law come from? You can't get to morality using biology, chemistry or physics. We talked about that in the first uh, workshop today, for those of you who are here this morning. The only way you can get a moral law is you need a moral law giver. Somebody needs to set the moral law, and therefore you need God. And in fact, the atheist's argument using evil only actually works if God exists. If there is no God, there is no moral lawgiver. If there is no moral lawgiver, there is no moral law. If there is no moral law, there is no good and evil, and therefore the atheist's question self-destructs. It only makes sense if God exists. There's a further interesting problem as well for our atheist friends that C.S. Lewis brought up as well. C.S. Lewis, who I quoted to you earlier, made a fascinating observation. He once remarked, he said, it's very interesting how my sceptical friends think that suffering and pain and disease and famine and all of these things make such a magnificent case against God. He says, if this is the case, how did the concept of God arise in the first place? I mean, let's think about it. Our medieval ancestors, those before them, they believed in God in a world in which there was no free public health care. There was a limited life expectancy. There were no endless donuts at Tim Hortons. There were all kinds of things they did not enjoy. Life was fairly short and brutal in the Middle Ages and in the Stone Age and wherever you go. Back in human history, before our ancestors had all of the things that we enjoy. How on earth, says Lewis, did the concept of God arise in the first place? He writes this. Lewis says, if the universe is so bad, or even half so bad as the pessimists claim, how on earth did human beings ever come to attribute it to the activity of a wise and good creator? Men are fools, perhaps, but hardly as foolish as that. The direct inference from black to white, from evil flower to virtuous root, from senseless work to a workman infinitely wise, staggers belief. In other words, if, if evil is such a good argument against God, how did the concept of God arise in the first place? Either our ancestors were stupid beyond belief, which smacks of chronological snobbery, or else it's not quite as simple as that, and we are missing something. I think our atheist friends are missing something. In fact, this is the interesting thing. Christians and Jews have always known that the world is a messy place. We didn't find out that the world was a messy place when Richard Dawkins wrote a book on atheism in 2006. Then we went, oh, really? There's evil out there. Thanks, Richard. We hadn't spotted that. That's not when Christians and Jews first worked out there was evil and suffering in the world. Christians and Jews have known that for thousands of years. It's not something Bart Ehrman suddenly discovered. You see, it surprises my atheist friends very often to discover that some of the most powerful writing, raising the problem of evil and asking God what's going on, is not found in atheist writing, but is found right in Scripture itself. 
The Christians and Jews have always known that the world was messy. The Bible has never attempted to be dishonest about that fact. Listen to these words from Psalm 73, or if you have a Bible with you, feel free to turn to it, if that's easier for you, because I know the PowerPoint is a bit small. Psalm 73, verses 2 through 4, and uh, verse 7 and 11, I'm going to read to you. The psalmist writes this, As for me, my feet had nearly slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. From their callous hearts comes evil. Their evil knows no limits. They scoff. How can God know? Does God really have knowledge? You can see the questions here on the lips of the psalmist. So unfair does it seem to the writer of Psalm 73 that those who do evil are prospering, that those who are immoral are doing well. So unfair does it seem to him that he is tempted to to cave in, give up, and go and write a book like Bart Ehrman's. So tempting is that to him when he looks at the problem and he asks the question, why, God, why? And that's a question that rings out of the Psalms. Many of the Psalms that raise that question. The Psalmist is not afraid of asking God that question. The Bible is not afraid of talking about that question. It is not a new question. Our atheist friends are not the first to raise this. And there is a further problem for our atheist friends too. There's a further problem for our atheist friends too. Those who wish to remove God from the equation actually take away one of the biggest resources you have for dealing with the problem of evil. You see, if you remove God from the equation, you don't solve the problem of evil. If you deny God, you do not bring peace to our southern Sudan. If you reject God, you do not suddenly find the cure for HIV and AIDS. If you, if you declare there is no God in heaven, you do not solve the problem of poverty. You don't solve the problem by denying God. If you deny God, you are left with the problem of evil and you have thrown out perhaps the biggest resource we have for dealing with it and saying something intelligent about it. You don't solve the problem through atheism. You see, the reality is that evil is a problem for everybody. The reality is that evil is a problem for everybody. Every worldview, we spoke earlier today, for those of you who are here in the morning session about worldviews, every worldview, whether you are Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or Christian or Jew or atheist, you have to deal with the problem of evil. The problem of evil is a problem for everybody. Every one of us must face the problem of evil and suffering because arguably it is one of the defining questions of human existence. And before I look at what the Bible has to say, I want to briefly look at what some of the other popular worldviews out there have to say, because it's helpful to compare and contrast. In fact, my friend Oz Guinness, who also works for RZAM, has famously said that comparison is the mother of clarity. And before you give a Christian answer, compare what the other worldviews say, so we see what the alternative worldviews out there have to say about a question. Comparison is the mother of clarity. What do the other worldviews, or some of them, have to say about the problem of evil? Well, if you look to the East... If you look to Hinduism and to Buddhism, two very, very popular worldviews, and Eastern thought is creeping here into the West too. What do Eastern theologies, Eastern worldviews like Hinduism and Buddhism have to say to the problem of evil? Well, they tend to tackle it in one of two ways. They appeal to either the doctrine of uh, Maya or they appeal to the doctrine of karma. The doctrine of Maya is the idea that the world is an illusion. So it may look like there is suffering and pain and injustice out there, but that world is illusory. And the whole purpose of our life here on earth is through meditation and uh, through transcendental experiences to focus our mind on the really real and ignore the illusory out there. And the, the world of pain and suffering and hurt is not real. We need to escape from it to the higher realities to which Buddhism and Hinduism allegedly will take us. Alternatively, Eastern thought goes in a different direction. The other route you can go in Eastern thought is you can appeal to karma. And karma, which is the word some of us may be familiar with, is the idea that actually if you experience suffering or evil or pain or injustice in this life now, then actually that's because of something you did in a previous life. So if I, fall, if I trip in my hotel room shower tomorrow, stub my toe, fall over, break my nose on the floor, it's because in a previous life I said something not naughty to somebody in Tim Hortons. The world goes around in a great circle and we get our just desserts. Two very big ideas in Eastern thought. But the problem is they don't actually work. Think of the um, Amish school shooting and try and apply these this theology to that. What does it mean to say to those hurting families, those bereaved families, don't worry, 
You think that you've lost your loved ones, your children in a school shooting. That's only an illusion. Put it behind you. Evil is not real. Well, what does that say to the hurting uh, parent, to the bereaved family? The answer is it's no answer at all. What does it mean to say to those families, well, yeah, your daughter got killed in a school shooting, but that's okay, because in a previous life, perhaps she was a rapist. And so actually, it's cosmic payback. Don't worry. Everything balances out in the end. Those are not just, not just bad answers. They are no answers at all. They are, quite frankly, fundamentally useless when, it's fa- when you face the real world of pain and suffering. Well, what about our atheist friends? What about our secular friends? What does the world of atheism and naturalism have to say uh, to the problem of suffering and evil? Our atheist friends have to address this problem too. Well, for the atheist, the problem is that evil is simply a natural part of the world. Evil is a natural part of the world. Everything we see around us is the result of time plus chance plus natural selection. The strong survive, the weak fall by the wayside, and people are going to get hurt. Nature is red in tooth and claw suffering is simply the way of the world and there's no point fighting over it. In fact the atheist Richard Dawkins has uh, famously written this. He wrote, if there is mercy in nature it is accidental nature is neither kind nor cruel but utterly indifferent that is pretty bleak stuff. Well it gets bleaker because the world in which we are living for our atheist friends, and again we talked about this this morning, is one that is moving towards destruction and annihilation. One day the human race will become extinct. One day the sun will expand and swallow the earth, and it will become hot, even here in Edmonton. And one day the universe will come to an end, empty and dark, and everything will, will end in a great full stop. And thus an atheist of a previous generation, and uh, we had this quotation earlier today, Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous atheist thinkers of the 20th century wrote this looking at the fact that everything is going to end in extinction wrote only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built what is the answer to evil and suffering for the atheist well there is no answer all we can do is grin and bear it whistle in the wind and realize it is part of the way that the world is going to be there is no good there is no evil there is no answer to injustice we simply have to grin and bear it there's another problem too of course for our atheist friends though the problem is not simply that that doesn't really work in the real world try living like that try saying to those bereaved parents never mind just grin and bear it okay you've lost those children hey you're young you can have some new ones how does that work Well, there's another problem for the atheist too. The problem of evil is one problem, but the problem of good is the flip side of that problem. You see, why does good exist is a great question for our atheist friends. On Bart Ehrman's worldview, why bother at all? If there is no God, then there is no good and loving creator. And then there is actually no such thing as justice or beauty or truth or morality. All of those things actually require God in order to work. So why are human beings bothered about them? Why don't we simply grin and bear it? Why don't we simply give up and say, hey, eat, drink and be merry. Tomorrow we die. We can forget about fighting for justice. We can forget about truth. We can forget about beauty. We can forget all about those things. There is no such thing as good, really good on atheism but most human beings instinctively know that's false most human beings even if they are utter atheists know deep down in their atheist hearts that there is good that there is evil that some things are laudable and praiseworthy and other things are to be condemned and again atheism doesn't therefore really work in the real world now all of this tells you and again we We picked up on this idea a little bit on the worldview lecture this morning. All of this tells you as you explore these other worldviews that there are profound differences. In fact, the differences make a difference. All worldviews are not the same. Hinduism is not the same as Islam, which is not the same as atheism. What you believe matters because what you believe will affect so many things about how you live your life, the choices you make and the conclusions you come to. And on the problem of suffering and evil, perhaps that most profound question of all, the worldview that you adopt will fuel your answers or end up providing no answers at all, which is what I think we see in Buddhism, Hinduism and atheism and uh, Islam and the other worldviews too if we had time to look at them. So what does the Bible have to say? We've talked about other worldviews. What does the Bible have to say when it comes to this problem of evil, the problem of suffering and pain? What's the biblical answer to these things? Well, the biblical worldview doesn't simply uh, disagree 
with Buddhism and Hinduism and atheism. It doesn't, it doesn't just disagree with those other worldviews. It profoundly stands against them and says they are utterly wrong. Here's the first thing that the Bible says about evil that I think is hugely significant, and we'll see why in a moment. The Bible begins its answers to the problem of evil and in and setting out what God has done about it by noting something really important. The Bible begins almost from the very first few pages by making the point that the world is not as God intended it to be. According to the Bible, evil is completely, utterly, radically, and flagrantly counter to the character and purpose of God. The world is not the way it was intended to be. According to the biblical story, evil is, like a, evil is almost like a cancer that has broken out in God's good and perfect uh, creation. Evil is an alien intrusion affecting both human beings and creation itself. That's the first recognition of the biblical worldview. And even that is profound. It's profound for this reason. When most of us, no matter what our worldview, look at an example of evil and suffering, we see an example of injustice. We see some terrible crime reported. We see stories of human trafficking in Cambodia or genocide in Rwanda or whatever it is we read in our newspaper. Most human beings, no matter what you believe, our instinctive reaction is to go, that is not right. That is unjust. That is unfair. Somebody should do something about that. That's our natural instinctive response. Our natural instinctive response is not to say with Richard Dawkins, oh, don't worry, evil that, isn't, that doesn't really exist. Nature is red in tooth and claw. That is not our reaction. The instinctive human reaction is to say something ought to be done about that. And so the Bible is very interesting. The Bible says, yes, that is correct, that that is our human response and natural response. Because the Bible says, hey, guess what? We as human beings, we are made in the image of God. And we are designed to built into us is that instinct that pain and suffering and death are not normal. And so that gut instinct we feel tells us that we are aligned to a different worldview. It tells us that we recognize instinctively that they are not the way the world is supposed to be. The Bible begins then very realistically by naming evil as evil in fact the bible goes further and says evil is to be expected and we'll talk about this in a moment given what's happened but even recognizing that that evil is evil even naming evil as evil even saying that the world is not the way it is supposed to be can affect you quite profoundly the gentleman on the screen uh, behind me is the uh, is the english poet wh alden very famous english poet from the 20th century and his story is a very interesting one. He, uh, he grew up in the church, grew up in the Anglican church, and uh, lost his faith as a young man. Uh, don't make the connection between Anglican and losing your faith. That's, that's desperately uh, unfair. And, uh, but it's a good joke, nevertheless, if there aren't any Anglicans here. I did some Baptist jokes too, so don't get too smug. Um, Alden grows up in the church as a young man, leaves it though, falls away from his faith, and becomes a humanist. And he basically buys into this kind of utopian dream. He thinks the world is going to get better and better and better, and everything will be wonderful, and everything will end up smelling of roses well in 1939 he moves to manhattan he moves to the to america to new york and to manhattan to a german part of the city and one afternoon he finds himself sitting in a cinema in a german part of the city and uh, as the newsreel comes on and in those days the way you got your news was they would play it on the cinema screen before the main movie came on and so he's sitting in the cinema ger largely german audience and the newsreel comes on and shows german troops marching into poland at the start of what would become world war ii and Alden was shocked to hear Germans in the audience around him began cheering and clapping as Polish people were, were seen on the screen being killed, shot and bayoneted by German troops. He says he was shocked to hear Germans in the audience begin clapping and cheering, kill, kill, kill the Poles, and leaping up with excitement every time there was a death on the, on the screen in front of him. He says he walked out of the cinema, his head spinning with what he'd just seen, and he realized, he said, I realized two things with a shock. He he said, instantly I realized that there was real evil in the world. My idea that the world was getting better was demolished instantly. He said, for the first time in my life, I had seen real evil. And then immediately, he says, I realized that my worldview couldn't explain it. He said, I knew there had to be a reason, a real reason, why Hitler was wrong. Not just my personal preference, there had to be an actual reason. And as he began trying to find that and think that through, that exploration led him back to the God of his youth. And he rediscovered the Christian faith that he had left all those years ago. He went on to write this. He said, only a God outside the world can define good and evil in such a way that it can explain what we see and enable us to name evil as evil. 
Only a God outside the world can actually enable us to name evil as evil. And if we can't name it correctly, we, can, we can't deal with the problem. The Bible begins, very honestly, by naming evil as evil and by telling us that the world is not the way it is supposed to be. Evil is an alien intrusion. Now, as it does that, what's interesting is the Bible isn't particularly interested in giving us clever philosophical answers as to why there is evil in the world. The Bible gives a few hints and a few clues. The most powerful biblical clue, I think, is that uh, the Bible says that the key of the supreme ethic that God has woven in uh, to this creation is love. Love is the supreme ethic uh, that God has woven in uh, to creation. And that God created us, desiring, uh, desiring that we would come to love him and we would choose to follow him. But the thing is this, of course, you can't coerce somebody into loving you. You can't coerce somebody into loving you. If I was to produce a gun from behind the lectern here, point it at some poor random victim in the front row. You knew there was a reason you sat in the front row this afternoon. And I was to say to you, tell me that you love me. At gunpoint, and you said that in a quit, you were a quivering wreck. I'm looking at you, and you go, Okay, I love you. Would that mean anything? No, it wouldn't, because it's at the end of a shotgun. You can't force someone to love you. Love requires freedom. And so God gave us the gift of freedom. God created us free, free to choose to love him, free to choose to love others. But with that freedom came the possibility to choose hatred. And the Bible weaves in this idea throughout the biblical story that God has given us this gift of freedom that would make love and relationship possible. But with that comes the choice that we would have to abuse that freedom and choose hatred. There is a lot to be said for that approach. And many philosophers have taken that biblical idea and woven very clever arguments around them. And there's much to be said for it. But the interesting thing is that the Bible is not actually interested in philosophical answers to the problem of evil. The Bible is not interested in giving us a philosophical answer to the problem of evil. And I find that very encouraging. And I'm actually a philosopher. You see, most of us, when we are faced with evil and suffering, pain, injustice, either in our lives or in the lives of others, perhaps those that we love, what most of us want is not actually some clever answer. Most of us, when we experience suffering and evil, don't want some clever answer. What most of us want when we see evil and suffering and pain, we don't want something said about evil and suffering. We want something done about evil and suffering. And this is the approach that the Bible takes. The Bible does not set out so much to tell us what God has said about evil. The Bible is far more concerned with telling us what God has done about evil. As the theologian P.T. Forsyth once wrote, he said, No clever arguments of man can ever justify God because of the way the world is. Faced with the problem of evil, God must justify himself. God must do something. And of course, God has done something. And as it sets out to tell the story of what God has done about evil, the Bible tells the story of the one event in history where many of these themes that we've been talking about this afternoon converge, where the theme of love and suffering and pain and evil and goodness all come together. And they come together in a cross on a, on a, on a Judean hillside. It's the story of how God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and how the powers of evil did their very worst to him as he hung on the cross. Because of his great love for us, says scripture, Jesus chose to submit to the very worst that evil could do to him. Suffering and pain led to death. And in the death of Jesus, God condemned evil and passed sentence on it. One theologian said that the death of Jesus is God's great no with an exclamation mark to evil. You see, evil did its worst to Jesus. Death did its worst to Jesus. And then its power was exhausted. And that's why Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus didn't rise from the dead because of some random miracle. Jesus rose from the dead because evil's power had been broken. The power of death was broken and could no longer hold on to him. The resurrection happened because evil had been defeated. Sin forgiven and forgiveness and freedom made possible. You see, the New Testament does not offer us a philosophy. The New Testament does not offer us a philosophy. Instead, it tells us a story, a story unique amongst all of the world's religions and ideologies and worldviews. The story of how the creator God took responsibility for sin and evil, took responsibility for what has happened to creation and has borne that weight on his own shoulders. In the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, God got his feet dirty with the mess of the world and he got his hands bloody with the nails of the world. That, in short, is what God has done about the problem of evil.
Now, as we say all of those things, evil and suffering will, to some extent, remain, to some degree, a mystery. And, a, because it, and the reason it remains to, somewhat, to some degree a mystery is because the problem includes us. I talked about this idea at the start. Each one of us here in this room, in fact, is caught up in the problem of evil. The problem includes us. We're personally affected by it. At times we're part of the problem. And the biblical story of what God has done about evil, the story of Jesus and the cross, is a story that actually challenges each one of us, each human being personally. It's also a story that challenges those two traps I talked about at the start of the lecture. It's a story that's any, there's a huge challenge, for example, to the trap, to the myth of a dualism. This tendency we have to try and divide the world into good people and bad people and put ourselves in this category. The way that the question I even phrased today, why do bad things happen to good people, implies that I'm a good person and it's not fair that bad things have happened to me. The Bible doesn't let us make that mistake of, tra- of, tra- of separating the world into good people and bad people. It doesn't allow us to do that. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the uh, Russian novelist and a survivor of the Russian concentration camps, reflecting on the whole issue of evil, once said something very interesting. He said the dividing line between good and evil runs right through the middle of every human heart. In other words, he is saying, the problem of evil and the problem of good is not an abstract one. It runs right through the middle of every human heart. Each one of us is capable of acts of tremendous goodness and charity and altruism. And each one of us, if we are very, very honest with ourselves, is capable of being petty and cruel and vindictive. The line runs right through the middle of every human heart. And the only solution to that fracture, says the Bible, is the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the place where if we allow him to and invite him into that broken, twisted, fractured heart of ours, he can deal with that break, that twist in God's good creation that is the source of all the problems in the first place. The biblical story is also, though, a challenge to the trap, to the myth of utopianism. It challenges dualism, but it also challenges uh, utopianism, the idea that human beings, if we try hard enough, can solve the problem on our own. That's been tried, as I said, and the 20th century proves that it doesn't work. We can't get to the new world. We can't get to heaven. We can't get to restored creation. We can't get to a perfect planet Earth by mere progress. But God's new world, God's new heavens, God's new Earth have broken into history in the person of Jesus. God's glorious future has broken into this world, can shine their light into this reality right now through the cross, through the resurrection of Jesus, if we allow him in to our lives. All of that brings us back to the story that I told you at the start of this talk, the story of the Amish school shooting. How does everything that I've said in the past half hour cast a light on that story, that tragedy from 2006? Well, three thoughts as we bring this lecture to a close. Number one, only the Christian worldview is utterly honest. Only the Christian worldview lets us look at the Amish school shooting and say, that is evil. Atheism doesn't allow that. Hinduism doesn't allow that. Buddhism doesn't allow that. Those other worldviews don't enable us to actually name evil as evil. And if we can't name the problem, it's very hard to begin working out any kind of solution, beginning to address it. Only the Bible actually lets us name evil for what it is and call it out. Secondly, only the Christian worldview tells us that God has decisively judged evil in the cross. Evil has been defeated. Its days are numbered and there will be be justice. And then thirdly and finally, one question we haven't really touched on over the last half hour. The other question that I said that the Amish school shooting uh, raises for us is how did the Amish community find the power to respond to that tragedy with forgiveness and love and compassion rather than with anger and bitterness? Very, very interesting question. And it's not an abstract question either, because one of the sad things I found about evil and suffering and pain is the way that if we're not careful, it can lock us up in the past. I've met far too many people in my relatively short years in ministry who, because of something that happened in the past, a tragedy, a bereavement, something that somebody said to them or did to them, some evil, some suffering in the past, they have not been able to let go and they are locked up in bitterness in the present. One of the vicious things about evil is the way that if it gets its claws into us, it can turn us into bitter, hateful, resentful people. We need the power to forgive. Where does that power come from? Well, the cross points the way. One last story. The lady on the screen behind me 
is a lady called Corrie Ten Boom. Some of you may have heard of her, particularly those of you who are a little bit at the older end of the demographic here uh, this afternoon. Uh, she was a very famous uh, speaker a few years ago, a very famous writer. Well, um, she grew up during the war. And in 1939, uh, she lived with her father and her sister in the Netherlands, uh, where her father ran a watchmaker's shop. Now, Holland fell to the Nazis in 1940, and so she and her family, uh, they were committed Christians, so they began helping smuggle Jews out of the country. They would hide them in their house, and then they would smuggle them out of the Netherlands to safety. Well, in 1944, disaster struck. They were discovered, and the family were arrested by the Germans. Her father died very quickly, but Corrie and her sister Betsy were shipped to Ravensbrück concentration camp. There they suffered terrible abuse and atrocities, and her sister Betsy eventually died an agonizing death. Well, Corrie survived, and she went on to start a post-war career as an evangelist, speaking about God's love. She traveled all over the world, and was very, very famous in her day. But then one day, something very shocking happened to her, and she describes this in her, in her autobiography. I'm going to read you a quote uh, from, in her own words. She writes this. She says, It was at a church service in Munich that I first saw him. The former SS officer who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück concentration camp. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly everything was there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, my sister's pain-blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said. To think that, as you say, Jesus has washed all of my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I couldn't. I felt nothing, not the slightest warmth of a spark of warmth or charity. And so I had to breathe a silent prayer. Jesus, I prayed, I cannot forgive this man. Give me your forgiveness. As I took that man's hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, an electric current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so she writes, I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on Christ's. The Bible does not answer all of our questions. We are not ultimately told all of the answers as to why radical evil was allowed to break forth in God's good creation. But we are told this. We are told that God is remaking the world and the decisive step has been taken. The death blow has been struck to evil. There will be ultimate justice and there will be a world in which forgiveness and reconciliation will form the bedrock and that all of that healing, all of that love, all of that reconciliation, all of that forgiveness, all of that justice flows from the cross. From Easter, where evil was broken, death defeated and the promise of forgiveness held out. You see, contra to Richard Dawkins, contra to Bertrand Russell, we do not live in a meaningless nihilistic universe. We live in a universe that is infused with meaning. We live in a universe that has a story, a story that is ultimately about love and a love story that ultimately has the cross and suffering right at the middle of it. If you fail to understand that story, you will not only fail to understand suffering, you will fail to understand life itself. You see, evil is still a four-letter word. But so is love. And love is God's last word. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at BreakForthMinistries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.